everyone. This is Kathy Mason from Mason Works Marketing here on Conscious Business Zone with my friend Paul Anthony Wallace, who is really Paul Wallace to me. But um, that's were you only called Paul Anthony Wallace when you're in trouble? <laughs> well, in fact, Paul Anthony Wallace was it was a middle name that I chose for myself at the age of 33. Wow, it was because cool. I had experienced this amazing pivot in my life where I felt that I'd come to the end of a lifetime and a new lifetime was opening up. And it was one where I was going to be much more deliberate about the way I live my life. Wow. And I felt I had to mark this moment in some way. And I thought, hey, here's a nice way I can do it. Let's get rid of the middle name I didn't like and replace it with one that's meaningful for me. I love it. It's so very... Paul Anthony Wallace is, has been my name since I was 33, and it marked changes in my life that led to me moving to Australia, meeting my wife, having a family, and everything that's happened since. Oh, that's great. Well, everyone, if you haven't met Paul before, I'm, I'm really excited. He lives in Australia, and so we've... Um, been able to figure out time the time zones well enough to do this uh, presentation tonight because he has a tremendous amount of knowledge that will help you understand the world that we live in in such a much better way, in such an, a much more logical and aligned way than what we... Um, may have been taught or read before. He's an internationally nationally best-selling author whose books probe the world's ancestral narratives for their insight into human origins, human potential, and our place in the cosmos. As a senior churchman, Paul served for 33 years, that's at 33 again, as a church doctor, a theological educator, and an archdeacon, in the Alec Angel, Angel um, Anglican, and thank you, Church in Australia. I knew I was going to blow one of those words. Sorry. He has published numerous titles on Christian mysticism and spirituality, and is a popular speaker at conferences around the world. In fact, he was just on um, a conference in, uh, through Zoom. In Sedona, he's been on George Norrie's Coast to Coast show, who also is one of the the um, the commenters on a lot of his books. He's he's well known by uh, the gentleman that wrote Chariot with the Gods. It's one of his mentors. So, Paul, I mean, the journey that you have taken from going deep into religious practice and all of the rituals and all of the um, really um, the whole customs of it to to now a totally different understanding came came through and you published the the series of Eden books and um, could you talk first of all so people understand about the aha. Um, after 33 years um, that you had. And then then I'd love to talk a little bit about the books For before sure. we get to your brand new book. Okay? I'll absolutely do that. Uh, people know me uh, as being a writer in the field of paleo contact. And paleo contact is the theory that we live in a populated cosmos and that in the deep past, our ancestors had contact with other civilizations, with extraterrestrial civilizations. And people look at that and say, well, how do you get there from your background in church ministry? Um, and really, it was my role as a theological educator uh, that sowed the seeds of what was to come because I would train pastors in something called hermeneutics. And hermeneutics are the principles of interpretation. And so in particular, I was teaching pastors uh, the skills of interpreting the scriptures. How do you get from these texts what the writers intended? How, you work, how do you work out what they intended? How do you do that rather than read something in? So this was what I talked about. And we talked about 
source analysis where you ask, is this the original form of the text? And if not, where did it come from? And how does it differ from the original? And why does it differ? And then we do form analysis. What kind of literature is this? How are we supposed to handle it? And then always the fundamental question, what do the words mean? So I learned these things at theological college, training to be a priest, and then I taught them later in my ministry to pastors. And the aha moment came when the universe gifted me with some time when I wasn't running a church or running a parish. Okay. And I could just follow my own curiosity, study up on things that had caught my attention through the years. And so I took those skills and applied them to anomalies in the Bible stories that had always bothered me. I'd always had questions about them. And when I taught from those bits of scripture, I always knew I was scratching around on the surface and there was something else going on. And some of the anomalies are obvious ones, the kind of things a child would point out reading the Bible. A child would say, why does God say, let us make? Why is it in the plural? Let us make the humans to look like one of us or one of who. Uh, a child will ask when you get to Genesis 3, who's the serpent? How come he could talk? How come he has legs at the beginning? Why would God create a being who's going to spoil things? Why would he expect the humans not to eat of the fruit of a tree that he's planted? Why would it be capital punishment if they did? Isn't this all out of proportion? He set them up for failure if he doesn't want them to have a knowledge of good and evil and then punishes them for when they make a mistake. And then you get to the flood. How can a God of love genocide a, a, an entire race? On and on it goes. And most grown-ups will struggle to give a really fair answer to those questions, and most pastors will as well. So there were obvious questions like that. So I started applying those skills to those anomalies, and I realized, yes, let us make that happens because the oldest word in the Bible that gets translated as God is Elohim. Right. And it means powerful ones, if you go to the root meaning, powerful ones. And it takes plural verb forms and plural attributives. And as I continued on my translation path, and I should say language is one of my first loves. That was what I first studied when I went to university back in the day, language and linguistics. And I discovered this word Elohim doesn't mean God, it means powerful ones. This word El Elion doesn't mean almighty God, it means the powerful one more powerful than the others. El Shaddai doesn't mean the almighty, and as I read through the editorial notes in many Bibles, they come clean and say that's a mistaken translation, that's not accurate. It probably means the powerful one, the destroyer. Wow. Yes. And so, I mean, that name doesn't sound very much like God. And then when you look at how the powerful one, the destroyer behaves, you realize well, that is what he does. He goes around destroying things and uh, fomenting wars, um, insisting on total war, genocides, which is surely the worst crime against humanity. And as you go to the root meanings of these words, a whole other story begins to emerge. So my first book in Paleo Contact, Escaping from Eden, resulted from me deciding to sit down, reread the Bible using the root meanings instead of the conventional translations. So read all the Elohim stories as powerful ones stories. And I realized that the stories were flipping, but not in a random way. They flipped so that they now lined up and I could see they were a summary form of the ancient narratives from Sumeria and the daughter cultures from ancient Sumeria, so Babylonia, Arcadia, Syria. And pretty soon I realized that our familiar God stories in the Bible are based on the Sumerian stories of sky people, uh, what today we would call extraterrestrials. So this throws up a logical question, what sense does it make for our God stories to be based on previous stories concerning extraterrestrials? And what's the truth of it? Can you have a true story based on a fiction? Or are we looking at a curation of human cultural memory? And that set me on a world tour 
uh, listening to ancestral narratives from all around the world and realizing that the themes of these sky people stories are repeated by cultures all around the world and they correlate in surprising detail. Details that talk about ancient visitations, colonization, and then how we were adapted from our ancestors by these visitors. And this was not a new idea. I should have recognized it because Plato taught it two and a half thousand years ago. When you train for the ministry, you have to study Plato. But somehow I'd missed out all the juicy bits uh -huh. where Plato pulls together many of these international stories and presents a coherent picture of the development of Homo sapiens being the evolution of life on Earth, but with external interventions in our story. So that was the aha moment, the process of rereading using root meanings. And really, all four of the Eden books have resulted from that exercise as I've thought through the implications and joined the dots. So so how did that um, how did those ahas affect you and your spiritual beliefs? Because you had you had to wonder, I mean. You you obviously are a mystic. You obviously have a connection, or at least that's what I I sense that you're a mystic, and you have a connection to source, and don't necessarily need to go through an intermediary to get information. But what you've been trained and um, groomed basically to be a um, example of a path. And then you have this awakening that, oops, maybe all of this isn't truth. Well, how, how did you deal with it? Well, it wasn't a sort of night and day shift for me because I think like many people who teach and preach from the Bible, I recognized that there was a conflict between how Jesus presents God, and how the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, present God. If you believe God is anything like what uh, Jesus shows us, then when you get to stories of xenophobia, violence, menace, threat, genocide, you know that can't be right. You know that can't be an accurate representation of God. They can't both be true. And so pastors and teachers do wrestle with those questions. So I was ready to read those texts in a different way. I knew something else was going on in those stories. But before I did that exercise, I didn't realize that the something else was paleo contact from start to finish. And so it certainly shifted how I read the Old Testament. And it did begin reframing my whole thinking about God. What does God mean? I have been delighted to find a wonderful definition that the Apostle Paul gave when he was effectively asked that question by a non-religious audience. So he couldn't just give a, a neat and tidy Jewish answer or a neat and tidy Christian answer. He sort of had to start from scratch. And what he said was, by God, I mean the source of the cosmos and everything in it, that in which we all live and move and have our being, of which we are all offspring. And I love that vision because it's it's a beautiful cosmic vision that is very inclusive. It says we're all emanations of source. So my intelligence is a participation in source intelligence. My consciousness is a participation in source consciousness. It makes some kind of a sense to express it that way. And having rediscovered Paul saying that, understanding that Paul was uh, deeply schooled by Plato, he was a huge fan of Plato. There are about a dozen famous sayings of the Apostle Paul that are really Plato quotes, where he's just changed a word or two here or there. I realized it was a more cosmic vision than the one I journeyed with, and that for a long time I had had a vision of God that was a being that was more powerful than all the other beings and who was kind of a puppet master over the cosmos. And as I started thinking things through and reframing, I realized this was a vision of God that was not really built on 
anything other than the habitual thought that we build up in communities of faith. And that if we're willing, willing to ask more fundamental questions, we'll come to something much more like the Apostle Paul said. And Plato, to go to him, as I researched for Escaping from Eden, I realized many of the early church fathers had derived a great deal of their thought from Plato. Plato really had encapsulated what was the worldview, the, the status quo of international thought at that point, mm -hmm. so that when people started listening to Jesus, it was against the background of Platonic thought. So it was important for me to go back to that place and, and see where they were at as Jesus began his ministry so I could hear what they were hearing. And when Plato talks about God, he's very, very interesting because he's not teaching a religion here. He's not uh, you know, trying to sell anything. These are his thoughts as a philosopher, as a scientist. And he argued this, that if you go far enough back, you will get to um, causes that precede the material cosmos. And if I can just add him to Einstein for a moment, because I find it helpful expressing it this way. Einstein proved with his general theory of relativity that time, space, energy, matter mm -hmm. all began at the same moment. Ah. And so if you go back far enough, we always want to know what came before. What was the planet like before it was like this? What was the mm -hmm. solar system like before it was like this? What was the galaxy like? What was the cosmos like before it was like this? Einstein says if you go far enough back, You'll reach a point where before doesn't mean before anymore. And Plato said, if you looked around at that point, you would see a unified field of consciousness. Oh, wow. That was what preceded the material cosmos. And that the material cosmos came into being in order for that consciousness to express itself and experience itself. And the whole of our story as human beings, life on Earth, the story of the cosmos, is the story of that consciousness unfolding itself and i could see that paul was tapping that idea when he talked about god so this has changed how i think about god i think about god less anthropomorphically and i certainly don't blame god for all the violence of the elohim and the powerful one the destroyer that we read about in the old testament and i think it's very important we separate those two concepts because if we think we live in a universe where we have to tiptoe around an almighty deity, that if we accidentally offend, there'll be eternal negative consequences. Right, right. That is psychologically so damaging to our intelligence and our emotional health. It is well beyond the time when we shake that off. And I really, in my books, hope to expose that that is a distortion of what God means and that that is really a memory of violent colonization in the deep past, and it will help us to name it as such and begin to get a more accurate picture of the cosmos in which we live. Yes, I I, I agree. Um, I grew up in a Jewish household, and um, the whole concept of God um, was so full of conditional love. <laughs> I mean, it, it almost is, it, it's, it's strange how... Um, there was this repeat after me technique, which I'm sure is in all religions that um, especially in Catholicism, it's in Latin and the audience may not even know Latin. They see pretty pictures on the wall and, um, you know, the, the art art told the story. But um, in Judaism, there's it's in Hebrew and you're um, just repeating after me. You aren't even quite sure as a child what you're saying. And um, I, I even remember when I went to my father's funeral um, and they were doing it. I, I just was like, I was 21 years old and I'm sitting there going, what are we all doing? Because we didn't and we didn't question it. That was the yes. obedience because you wanted to be. Um, good. <laughs> that conditional love was really was um, yes. drilled in. It really was. Absolutely. And I think one of the it's an exciting thing. And it's um, 
And it's a thing that can make, make you very angry when you drill into the history of that shift where religion becomes about conditional love and obedience or consequences. And in my latest book, The Eden Conspiracy, I show the moment in the history of Judaism where it shifted from being a canon of story about paleo contact to being a religion of worship and obedience. And it happened as um, one of the kings in particular, King Josiah, decided to pare the faith of his nation down to the worship and obedience of one deity called Yahweh, and then the obliteration of all other memory, getting rid of the memory of other advanced beings who had been honored for their positive impact on humanity in the deep past. And it was that shift that happened in the 7th and 6th century BCE that produced a religion that now was about worship and obedience. And Christianity framed itself around that as well. Right. But it's really a distortion of what the Hebrew scriptures have really carried, the stories they really carry. And it's certainly a dis distortion of what Jesus was on about when he turned up and started announcing that the powers and principles and people of the cosmos are available to us. Right. And for us to discover what the implications of that might be. Right. Right. And that that's what's intrigued me all along. Um, I found myself um, uh, cheering as I, as I'm um, reading, I haven't gotten to read all your book yet, but uh, your other books cheering as we uncover and peel the onion of reality because what happens is that this is the time this is your your work is so important at this time for people to really look at their role in their whole reality um the you're not a victim you're the creator and um what happens is if you don't know your origin and don't have a good feel for um us the gift that you are and the gifts that you have access to, then you can't play the role that was intended for you here. Jesus's work was built on awakening people to that, but the structures that were already established from, from the Old Testament time, from Babylonian times, um, didn't allow for that philosophy um, at that time, it was a it was a uh, threat to power. Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, Jesus did and said incredibly empowering things. I mean, when you think about the ministry that people recalled as they wrote it into the Gospels, the canonical Gospels and the Gnostic Gospels, it was mind stretching, worldview stretching. Yeah, you would look at that and think wow, what might be possible for me? And then Jesus turns around and says, well, these and even greater things will you do. So there couldn't be a greater invitation to explore what's possible for humanity than that. But because Christianity became framed around this violent image of God, which they had inherited from the Hebrew scriptures, that's a contrary worldview that says we exist only to serve the deity. Right. Our right. relevance is only to please and obey the deity. We're here as slaves. And there's so much in the teaching of Jesus and many of the spiritual greats through history that say, no, that's not our story. We're not slaves. We're more than that. We're capable of so much more. And as I traveled around the world listening to ancestral narratives from indigenous cultures, their expectations of human, humanity were much, much higher. And they would not only curate stories that would lead you to expect more and to expect to engage higher cognitive abilities and have a better human experience, they also curated shamanic protocols for switching other bits of your brain on so that you can operate at a higher level. And in my book, Echoes of Eden, I show how through hundreds and thousands of years, there's been an attempt to distract people from those stories, defame and dismiss those stories, suppress them, burn them if they're in book form, 
so that we can be a more manageable population of slaves, to use that word. Yeah. But the indigenous narratives and the hidden stories of the Bible have survived all through the ages so that in every generation we can rediscover them and rediscover who we really are and what we're really capable of. Perfect. I've been saying for a while that we're in the dark ages and we're coming back to a renaissance. And I really think that uh, the indigenous uh, stories, cultures, and connection to the earth is part of the renaissance because we are earth. We are a cell of the earth. And yes. uh, and we've somehow elevated ourselves out of that. Although I lived in Italy and I, I didn't feel that way there. It's it seems like it's maybe a US. I, I don't know which cultures have that um um uh, um what uh, it's not aristocratic, but it's a it's a um it's an a absence of connection to the earth by yes. defining yourself as not an animal yes i agree i think you're absolutely right i think really in any culture where you're in a very urbanized environment and where that is the cultural center you are being pulled away from your connection with nature so you will live in a built environment you won't have your feet on the ground, you'll mm -hmm. have it on concrete, you know, several stories high. And it is, if you acknowledge that we are part of nature, then it's logical that we will thrive less well when we're detached from nature. Right. right. And I do think that uh, Italy it has a culture that is more in touch with the earth. There is a delight in being part of nature. There's a delight in our animal nature, if I can put it that way. Yes. So yes. there's an em embracing of our our physicality, uh, an embracing of our gender identity, an embracing of food and drink That's and right. sex and yes. fun and yep. celebration. And I was. It took me a while to understand this cultural difference I was seeing when I spent some time in Italy as a student, and I went along to a political rally. Now, just to throw the contrast, if I'd gone to a political rally in London, we would have all stood around in a concrete square, feeling very angry, <laughs> and uh, and speeches would be made to, to, to rile us up. In Italy, there's food, there are pop stars singing, there's dancing, and now here's the politician giving the speech. And it was just such a joyful, holistic experience, uh, and it really showed me there's a big cultural difference between yeah. Great Britain and Italy that I hadn't fully realised until that point. And I think you're right to make that connection. I think that there's a real appetite in the present uh, in uh, our culture, in Western culture, people are feeling the need to get back to nature, right. to get their feet on the ground, to be in nature, deep breathing, to be yeah. eating natural, unspoiled, non-industrialized foods. Exactly. And people have these experiences through tourism, and then they think, I why am I living you know, in my concrete box so differently to how I feel alive when I'm in Amazonia or in India or, or wherever it might be? Yeah. And people are traveling in order to switch other bits of themselves on. And so there's been a real, um, uh, what's the phrase for it? A boom in ecotourism, people going to different parts of the world for the local ceremonies, Mm -hmm. uh, the psychoaffective teas that they can obtain in different countries because they want to switch bits of themselves on that have been turned off in their urbanized Western environment. I think right. the appetite for that is huge. And I certainly find that among people who contact me having read my books. Many of my readers are going through exactly right. that kind of a process of recovering what it means to be really human. Well, we've been in a pressure cooker, and it seems like um, if you stay with the lid on, <laughs> um, you get cooked. 
Uh, you really, yes. uh, the stress of this, it's it's not designed to create a creative problem solving culture in no. society. So, so um, okay, so we'll, we'll go back to this. I, I want uh, to navigate back to the information that's in your new book because I, um, I kind of already felt like it was true and then you validated it. Um, it, it seemed all along that there's that that Yahweh couldn't be human. It, it seemed like Yahweh there, there were not that he I mean God is a, that that idea of God is something more than human, but it wasn't loving. And um, yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't relate to the conditional. Um, uh, you have no other gods before me. You do something wrong, I get rid of the whole um, city. Um, I um, change it. You all can speak one language. I make sure you all can't. I mean, none of this made any sense um, for a loving God. And then I looked at colonization that happened during the crusades i one of my ma majors is art history so i look at all these things through art and you look at the people that came off of the island of england but the sun never set on the english empire what kind of humans jump off of a little island and go all over the world put their flag in the ground and and force their culture on everything. I mean, when you think about this, how how does how did that even happen if there wasn't something else in play here? Because yes. it, I, I just and I don't know if this isn't what you um probably expected me to ask, but but what do you think about that? Because I mean, sure, the the food's better in other places, so you might hop off the island to go get some other kind of food. But but seriously, when you think about them landing in India, planting their flag and changing the whole an ancient, ancient, ancient culture, how, how does that happen if it's a, if it's not an an ET or a Mm. Uh, some sort of bloodline. Well, I think you can see the template for that kind of colonization in the Bible itself. Oh, okay. So I argue in the Eden conspiracy that the memory of Yahweh is the memory of colonization, violent colonization by beings who were not human and therefore had no fellow feeling towards the human beings they were conquering and who had advanced technology by which they could enforce their conquests. There's a little window onto the process in the book of Ezekiel, where Ezekiel is being spoken to by a non-human being. Uh, the Hebrew word means life form, and the life form addresses him as human, or earthling. Uh, so that gives us a clue as to what's happening here. And the life form is wanting to shore up Yahweh's authority over his particular people group. And he takes Ezekiel into the temple and he says, look at this. You've got carvings of the Seva Hashemayim. That's, that's the heavenly host, to use the traditional language, or the sky armies, what it really means. This whole spectrum of beings who came and colonized. The people of Israel shouldn't be honoring these other ones. We need to get rid of that. They should be honoring only Yahweh. And so we're going to affect a purge here. Any family that is not aggrieved by these carvings of these other powerful ones will be put to death. Men, women, children. Now, that sounds ridiculous, but there are cultures today where if you don't demonstrate uh, heartfelt sorrow and grief 
when your leader is ill or dies, you're in big trouble. And that's the kind of situation we've got here, where you, the, the people had to prove their loyalty to Yahweh and their horror at the memory of these other powerful ones. And the ones who wouldn't do that would be disintegrated using two devices, the Kali Mashatau and the Kali Mapasau. Okay. And six individuals were able to ethnically cleanse an entire district oh. using those devices. That's yeah. in the book of Ezekiel. So here you've got a little window into what colonization meant under the rule of Yahweh. So now I come back to this King Josiah. Josiah becomes king at a time when Judaism included the commemoration of all kinds of beings with whom their ancestors had interacted in the past. And the book of Jeremiah and the book of Second Kings says that the people of Israel uh, remembered Yahweh with displeasure. And now I've just said what I've said. You can imagine why. Yeah. It says they derided him. They spoke slightingly of him and they rejected his laws. But they remembered others like Asherah with affection so that on every high hill and under every green tree and in every place they lived, there would be an installation commemorating Asherah, a female advanced being who had come and nurtured their ancestors, taught them farming, taught them how to build cities and become a civilization. So here's Josiah. Who is going to be our God moving forward? He wants to move to monotheism. He wants to obliterate the memory of paleocontact. He wants a theocracy, one God, one king, one high priest, and he picks Yahweh, the violent colonizer. And they go around, the armies then go around demolishing the installations to Asherah, and Dagon, and Baal, demolishing the standing stones representing the places where the people had met those advanced beings, demolishing the temples, disbanding the priesthoods. So now there's only Yahweh. There's only the high priest of Yahweh. There's only the king of Yahweh. And by choose, and of course, all the tithes now go to Jerusalem. So it's a centralization of power and wealth. And by picking a violent deity, Josiah has just given himself permission to take control by force. Because if Yahweh can do it, then a king of Yahweh can do it. Yes. And you can draw a straight line from that decision to many colonizations done in the name of God. So, for instance, when uh, Francisco Pizarro arrives in uh, Peru, 1532, San Mateo Bay. He's able to tell the locals, we are here as agents of Viracocha. Uh, you'll remember him because he genocided a whole group of you when you offended him. Well, we're his agents here with this impressive fleet and army. And we're now going to run your country and you'll thank us for it. And they gave themselves permission by correlating their story with the violence of the Peruvian story to use force to take over the country and have the people honor them as part of worshiping God. So when you've got a powerful narrative like that supporting your arrival and ally that with advanced technology, not as powerful as a Kali Mashatau, but more powerful than anything the locals had. Right, right. Well, that's how you take over. And you delete the old stories and they and replace them with your story. So you delete the old stories of paleo contact and replace it with Catholic orthodoxy. And that's just a reflection of what Josiah did when he deleted the memory of paleo contact and replaced it with monotheistic Yahwism. So it's simply a template we find in the Bible that's been repeated by empires all around the world who've used the image of a violent God and whatever technology they have to take advantage of those with less developed tech. So Same, same as it ever was. Well, so what um, I think we're coming to almost a point of disclosure at this point, there's UFOs seen every day. Um, everyone has a smartphone and can snap something in the sky. There's just so much information about um, 
uh, free energy. There's so, and the med beds and tes uh, Tesla devices. W what do you hope um, your your scholarly works do to help? with this awakening of mankind because what's happened is you're telling the truth i i call you a truther um if the i made up that word so i don't think it's a word but anyway um but what we're looking at is we we're in they call it an inverted matrix because you can't tell what's true and what's false and and things that you your parents taught you now are being revealed that uh, they, they did the best they could, no insult to the way we were brought up, but that those those things they taught us may not have been for our best uh, best growth. They were to um, they were fearful, basically. That's um, they were trying to keep us safe and alive, but really it kept us dumbed down and less expressive and less um, creative. So. Yes. What what do you hope? How does your do you hope that your work contributes to this awakening that uh, after disclosure it's going to make more sense uh, to everybody? Or are you are you hoping that your audience will um, use critical thinking? What what well, is your hope with your work? Because you, you've invested so much time and energy first in learning everything, so you're you're like a um, a collator of information, so we don't have to read all of those sacred texts that are. Look at all those books behind on that side. <laughs> well, I mean, I think that our ancestors created a canon of story all around the world to equip us to live in the present day. Oh. They they didn't just create stories to say, oh, this is what happened in the past. This was the experience we had. There is an education being offered to us in ancient story, including in the Bible, that gives us a lens by which to understand the world in which we live so that we will understand that there's a non-human layer to the governance of Project Earth. So we'll understand uh, realities of geopolitics. I mean, in the Eden Conspiracy, I show how the Hebrew scriptures teach us about covert government, um, the persistence of old powers, hidden hands in politics and world economics. They wanted us to understand those things so we would know how to thrive in a world that operates that way. So I hope my books are a gateway, not so people don't have to bother reading the other stories, <laughs> but so they'll have an appetite for reading them because oh, oh, okay. I've given just enough, just enough to whet people's appetite to get into that. And I think another hope is, I mean, I believe that what Haim Ashed said, Christmas 2020 is true. now. Haim Ashed was the Brigadier General who for 27 years was Israel's Chief of Space Security. And he said on the basis of his information, he said this publicly, the press conference, that we have been in contact with a galactic federation for a long, long time. And that that federation includes many, many ET demographics who are interested in the progress of Project Earth and humanity. I believe that's true. It's what our ancestors said in the Bible, in Norse mythology, Greek mythology, in Vedic literature, in African narratives. This story has been out there all this time, that there is this non-human layer to the governance of our planet and a great spectrum of beings on it. So that you have beings at the Yahweh end of the spectrum who are here because they're interested in what the planet has to offer. They have an exploitative attitude to us and our planet. And then you've got others at the other end of the spectrum represented by Asherah who are here to support and nurture humanity. And really my hope for the future is that there is that spectrum on the council and that we do have friends in high places who desire positive things for us. I have an old fashioned love of democracy. The idea that there may be people on that council 
representing our best interests. Of course. And I think our best hope of doing good exopolitics with our allies is for more of us to be in the picture. Uh, more of us to be wanting to know what's happening, who's representing us, what decisions are being made, and even if we feel out of the loop, to be alert, to understand what's happening and why it might be happening. I think there's a big push and pull of a struggle happening right now as to how the next few decades should play out. I know there's a lot of anxiety around the planet about what the powers might have in store for us. Right. Well, I believe that the future is not set in stone, that we have friends in high places who will want better things than some of the things that might be purposed for us. Yes. The non-human layer to human governance isn't a dark story. It's not all Mars attacks and invasion of the body snatchers. <laughs> and I also believe that contact goes way beyond what Hamish Shedd was speaking about when he talked about contact at a covert government level. Listen to tribal elders all around the world, and they will say that they are in contact and that traditional healers are in contact and that you and I, if we learn to tune in, can be in contact I as am. well. I am. Because you and I work out how do I navigate this world where I seem so disempowered and there seem to be so many closed doors. How do I thrive? How does my family thrive? Ancestral narratives say you are not on your own in finding answers to that question. Every one of us has cosmic help. And Earth. that is something I would really love for people to begin looking for, tapping and experience as uh, the aftermath of reading my books. Fantastic. Um, I'm a, a, a participant in a, gr in a group, nonprofit group that meets used to meet before COVID, um, met once a month called Boulder Exo, and it's exopolitics. And a lot of the speakers that speak at Gaia TV um, would come and speak to us on Friday night before they'd go do their their work with Gaia. So, so we got to have incredible talent come through. And one of the speakers, I think it was, um, trying to think, um, I'll, I'll think of the person's name. He said that there were 58 species of ETs um, here on the earth right now that um, had, there's all, and then there's all these hybrids of them. So we're really, truly um, a melting pot. <laughs> and yes. and um, the, the opportunity for, that's why it's a gem in the, in the galaxy is that this experiment has so many varieties, so many colors of people, so many different insects and birds and uh, the variety uh, uh, that's available here is is truly remarkable and that they are definitely, and, and I believe this, I, I've been, um, uh, I've been, working with the ETs for most of my life. I remember at eight years old, starting to work with them. Not, not that I was abducted. I was talking to them here, but, um, yes. but I, I truly believe that uh, there, the fear virus is really what we're going through. And the more that you can educate yourself on the truth, which is what you're offering. You're offering a glimpse into the truth of reality that has been hidden, but is no longer allowed to be hidden anymore. And it just takes us a little bit of a little bit of effort to read a book, to listen to some um, interviews, to go and spend the time to really wonder, uh, and and release the victim shackles that we all have been living under to create this new world, this new earth that's begging to be born since 20, 2012. It's, yes. it's been emerging. And they, the, the opportunities for us, we have to choose it. So that's the other thing. I see your work as uh, creating freedom 
freedom from fear and freedom um, from shackles of the past. Definitely. And, you know, the beautiful experience that you've described, many people have that experience of help, uh, nudges, tutelage, conversations that are nurturing their progress through life without ever knowing quite who it is who's helping them. Yeah. And people might process it through a Christian worldview and say, well, I think God is helping me or my angels are angels. helping me. Mm -hmm. Other cultures will say my ancestors are with That's me. Mm -hmm. 1 John 4 in the New Testament is completely agnostic as to who or what the spirits are that you'll be hearing from, but you can expect good information. And I always try and encourage the people I coach to really embrace that experience, to know that that is real, mm -hmm. that we all do have an invisible team of supporters assisting us, and to engage with it, to ask questions. And it's not that we surrender our mind or our sovereignty. It's very important that you weigh and consider what you hear and you make your own decisions according to what you feel makes sense. But know that you have a team. Right. Know that you have helpers. And this is the positive of the worldview that comes from so many indigenous narratives, which have been dismissed, laughed at, suppressed, uh, or very aggressively shut down at various times or defamed and demonized as witchcraft or idolatry. But it's the reality in which we all live. We all have helpers wishing to support our journey through life. And so, again, in my coaching and in my books, I want to shine a light on that and say this is something that has real credibility and that belongs to humanity. Every culture has a way of talking about this. And if you and I can embrace it, then we're better equipped to have a better human experience. Right, right. It's perfect. And when you think about how the your work, this this new The Eden Conspiracy book, um, put, sheds light on the interaction and the support that we got 10,000 years ago to create a better civilization. Well, I'm... I'm hoping we're ready for the next one. I mean, if they, they're any of these beings that are in the Galactic Federation of Planets or the other beings that um, have the um, technology to come here, they have technology that could clean the oceans, clean the air, um, use, we have uh, health, health benefits that we have, haven't had um have no one should starve no one to i mean i'll think of the the prosperity and abundance on that level that um this contact once we're not afraid of the contact um exactly what, yes that's what exactly. your work is doing too it's creating reducing the fear of it definitely and it's amazing, simply going to the root meanings of key words in our ancient text gets you there. Mm -hmm. Because if I, I just give one example. At the beginning of Matthew's gospel, we have a summary of the message that Jesus toured with for his first year of public ministry. The way it's conventionally translated sounds very much like that fear-based religion. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right. And that sounds like a grave warning. It sounds like he's saying, you sort your life out because God is about to show up and you wouldn't want to be on the wrong side of him. <laughs> but you get to the root meanings. Repent means go beyond the mind. Go beyond your mind. Go beyond what you think. Think with more than this. Go beyond the mind because the realm of the cosmos is available to you. Perfect. That's a cosmos of resources, a cosmos of powers, a cosmos of neighbors available to you. And his invitation is for us to unpack what that means. We have all these resources for a better human experience. And look at how the translation has distorted that message to becoming one of you behave and shut up and do what you're told. Right. So diminishing so demeaning 
and the other so empowering and exciting and sets us on a journey of exploration. And if I say, oh, I work in Bible translation, you might not expect that that's, that's the outcome of it, but that is the outcome of it. Isn't that fabulous? I know that's what, um, that's the irony of all of this. That's what, I'm sorry, I'm giggling, but it's interesting how the deeper you go, the more the, the uh, truth is revealed and the truth is a surprise almost in this case, right? Yes, yes, that's right. Oh. And I mean, just through the process of writing the books, I've sort of circled around and spiraled in and gone deeper each time and found more and more encouragement and more and more empowering information on a bigger and bigger canvas so that it's not just stories about our past, not just stories about geopolitics, not just stories about human potential, but actually in the Eden Conspiracy, it produces a vision that has to do with human society and how our society can progress and operate in a more positive and human kind of a way. Perfect. So the more you pour into these things, the bigger and bigger the implications appear. I love it. I can't wait to read the whole series. And and uh, I, I'm i going to be your number one fan as soon as I get to. <laughs> but, but I want to show oh, your you. website real quick um, so the audience can um, see that uh, your address, your URL is paulanthonywallace.com. And right. um, the books, so want to make sure people can see that um, it was, which one was the first one, the so scars? Es escaping, oh, escaping from, from Eden, Eden is the first, then okay. the scars of Eden. Okay. Then echoes of Eden. Is it? And is then it, okay. the scars of Eden is next. Okay. okay. And then echoes of Eden. And then you'll have to go back to the, the home menu on Paul Anthony Wallace and go to the first tile for the Eden Conspiracy, which has just there come out, 21st of April Yay. it was released, charting in Amazon, I'm delighted to say, all around the world. And if people want to read that and get into a conversation with me, you can reach me through my website, paulanthonywallace.com. I'm also in the comments every day in fifthkind.tv. Yes. That's our subscription website, fifthkind.tv. But you can find us on YouTube as well, the Fifth oh, Kind you... TV and the Paul Wallace channel. Yeah, and I want to encourage people to watch as many YouTubes as you can. Paul is brilliant. And um, the way that he articulates everything, it's um, in digestible bites. It's not um, like a academic uh, presentation that you can't understand and you wish you took notes <laughs> you 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 know you do a brilliant job of communicating the information and um and and it's um entertaining as well as hopeful this isn't we're we're not talking about a um a, um a shaming blaming uh uh fist <laughs> fist uh shaking presentation of the past and how could they we're just trying to understand our origins so that we can do a better job of being who we are and create a better society a better world for for the future generations that's what if the indigenous a lot of the american indians um they everything they every decision they made was how will it affect seven generations? Well, what you've done is you've done a big, big gift to the next seven generations with your work, Paul, really. Well, thank you. I mean, that's certainly my hope. I, I love the fact that I'm being read, as any uh, reader would. But what you say, yes, that is in my mind, because Every generation needs to rediscover these things. And sometimes they do it by digging up old books. So if in a couple of generations' time, people find dusty copies of the Eden Conspiracy, I will be looking down and feeling absolutely delighted if it's still inspiring and setting people free long after I've gone. Well, I, I have a sense that um, once the... Once disclosure happens... 
that it's going to be a lot faster than we think. Because as I said before, um, the the sky, is, it, especially in Mexico and South America, um, the sky is just filled yeah. with, with ships. And I believe that they may have been cloaked before, but because we're in this platonic belt in the Milky Way now, they um, we, we're raising our frequencies and they're not, as cloaked as they yes. were they may have been here all uh, along i think also there might be a political aspect to it as well that the policy of non-disclosure which wasn't decided by our governments it was decided here yes i think that is not as watertight as it's been in the past and that okay. there are more demographics saying no we don't hold to this non-disclosure thing anymore because there's far more leakage now than there's been in decades previous. Yes. And I that's part of what me, makes me feel hopeful that things are not set in stone, that there is that much more contact experience happening. And, you know, some cultures are more willing to acknowledge it, but even the USA has now acknowledged the phenomenon of at least UFO contact and then with the implications flowing from that. So yes. things are shifting. Yes, yes. I'm very hopeful because I think um, when we get free energy, that'll change the whole. It changes everything. Everything. So so that that's the first step. And I feel like we've been very close for a long time. I don't know if you know about the Keshi Foundation, but um, in, in 2018, I think it was, um, the head of the Keshi Foundation gave a um it was only eight hundred dollars to build this unit that was uh, uh could could run the electricity in your house and he he had the only he had a um event in switzerland i think and he invited heads from all over the world and mostly it was just the african countries that came and um the you had to sign a piece a piece uh proclamation and a, a document to commit to peace in order to get the device. And only a handful of people knew about it. And I, I was lucky enough I knew about it, but um, it wasn't allowed to come into the U.S., but plans did. The plans mm. did. But um, but anyway, so there's there are people that are working behind the scenes that are trying to get the free energy out, the med beds out yes. um, and um, reconnect us to the source uh, the, of vitality so that we can live um, in a totally different space <laughs> of uh, food nourished on ev all levels. Yeah. And I mean, the, uh, the implications for how earth is run uh, would be enormous from the availability of free energy. You know, people can often feel very disempowered and hopeless when we think about the 1% calling the shots, the 1% who own everything, the 1% who, who decide whether we have wars or whether we have peace. Right. How on earth do we shift that? Well, free energy goes a long way to doing that because right. that, alters the power dyna dynamics at a human level across the planet. It disempowers some very significant families and corporations and frees us up to make decisions that are not um, hijacked by yes. those powers. Suddenly right. the history of warfare would change the moment we have free energy. And I think it's why Ed Mitchell, who campaigned so fearlessly for disclosure and declassification of UFO files, for him, it wasn't just about, let's have a conversation about ETs where it, it's not all jokes. He focused on free energy and the implications of it. I mean, in Britain, it would mean you don't have old age pensioners freezing to death every year. I, I, I know, just doesn't make sense. That's what uh, I'm saying. It, in Australia, we have people who can't afford to keep their homes because they can't afford the electricity and gas, despite the fact that Australia has a surplus of both those things. Free energy changes all that. And I think if we had disclosure, honesty about the contact we're in, 
honesty about technology sharing, it would be you could no longer right. keep the fence around that technology. Right. Humanity has to have it, and it will change everything. Well, my hope is also that your books and and work like this helps people have a critical eye rather than just follow the um, party line, follow any of the media, um, um, the disciplines that we've all been trained in. Where, where, because I, I, that's why I'm seeing, I'm seeing people wondering now and where they might have always just followed um, uh, the, the, um, what's the right words? Um, their, their training was to follow and be obedient to the rules. And now yes. people are really questioning, but, but, uh, but I'm hoping that it goes past, like, for instance, there were, uprisings in um in france recently and there were uprisings i guess the last time uh pluto was in the same spot was when, in the french revolution but then afterwards napoleon came in so <laughs> so this is why your work is really important we need to wake people up we're in at an era where we can connect with people all around the world. We, uh, we can share knowledge. We can share inspiration. We can share technologies that'll help us create something different that isn't going back to monarchies or dictatorships or yes. um, the void, the void wants to be filled, but it doesn't want to be filled with the same no. history. Exactly. That's exactly right. And I think that is a big part of the message that's hidden in the Bible by mistranslation. Uh -huh. We have been prepped for this moment. We're not coming to it without wisdom to draw upon. Perfect. Perfect. Well, Paul, thank you so much for your time. And it's such a pleasure. I, I have tons more questions and hopefully we can do this again because- for sure. Um, Again, I because of my interest with the ETs, I'd love to know more about the ETs, but I wanted to make sure that people knew to get your new book or to get the whole series. Um, but then the new book will really open your eyes to the truth of our history and give you a whole different perspective, a different way of looking at everything and creating a kind, loving world. And that's that's what we all want. We don't want war anymore. Right? Amen. Amen to that. Okay. So once again, we want um everyone to go to paulanthonywallace.com and also to the um is it uh go to fifth, your YouTube fifth kind, channel? Fifth kind dot TV. Fifthkind.tv. And on YouTube you can find the Fifth Kind TV and the Paul Wallace channel. Perfect. Perfect. And, and uh, you'll be glad you did. <laughs> well, thank you very much. My cat can't figure it out if it's in or out. Well. Aww, in true cat style. <laughs> thank you, Kathy. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.